show, top of the hour. It's a Friday. Have you noticed how busy Fridays are? We start with that breaking news out of New York. A man setting himself on fire almost at the exact same moment that the jury is seated in Donald Trump's historic trial. That man in critical condition tonight. What we're hearing from police and what witnesses at the scene are saying. We are live with our reporter who saw it all happen. We are also live with new reaction from the White House and around the world as leaders ask both Israel and Iran to try to contain themselves and hold back after new rounds of strikes. We're breaking down what the U.S. expects to happen next. Then in tonight's original, original while, while China's middle class is really not so sure right now about its future, with the country's economy not growing at the rate it was pre-pandemic. Plus tonight's backstory, our Capitol Hill team giving us the inside look at House Speaker Mike Johnson and how he is, in fact, moving the U.S. closer than ever to banning TikTok, how Johnson's handling his rise and the potential fall. That, according to our reporter, who has covered him for years. And hello, Swifties. Taylor Swift's new album is out to huge fanfare. But are fans down bad with how it turned out? Find out later in the show. All right, good day. I'm Tom Costello. It is a Friday. I'm in for Halley, and we are starting with that terrifying scene out of the first of its kind trial of a former president. A man apparently set himself on fire just steps from the courthouse, for the jury was today selected to decide Donald Trump's fate. And we will warn you, the image we're about to show you may be disturbing to many. You see it right here, the fire from a distance caught by our cameras, essentially with local teams on the scene and our team watching all of the chaos happen, including the police who rushed over to see what was happen happening in an area that was specifically set aside for protesters. Take a look right there, papers that the man actually threw up in the air as he was approaching the region. At this hour, no indication it has anything to do with the trial, but the NYPD says it may now have to beef up security. Take a listen. This gentleman did not breach the security protocols. The park was open to the public. But of course, we're going to look at everything and with the magnitude of what's going on around right here, we'll reassess our security with our federal partners. Okay, more on that in a moment as the stage is now set. The players picked and we're ready to go. The six alternates in the Trump trial, you see them here, ready to spend the next two months or so really on standby, in case there's any conflict coming up with the 12 jurors who will decide whether Trump is guilty on all 34 counts of lying on his business records, allegedly making hush money payments to the former adult film star Stormy Daniels. Mr. Trump denies having a sexual relationship with her. This day underscores the stress potential jurors are under. Two prospective jurors actually broke down in tears on the stand. And just in the last 20 minutes, we are hearing the former president again promising to testify at his trial. NBC's Von Hilliard outside the courthouse in Manhattan on a very busy and a chaotic day there. Uh, Von, we'll talk about the trial in just a moment, but let's start with the scary moments earlier in the day. And you were on the scene when this fire broke out. What can you tell us about the person involved here, and what did you hear from witnesses? Tom, this was a difficult day for folks that were around this area. This is just about 100 yards from the front doors of the courthouse. Donald Trump was inside of the courtroom at the time, and in fact, the final alternate jurors had, uh, had been selected, and they were actually walking out of the courtroom as this individual outside uh, set himself ablaze. For several minutes, he was engulfed in flames before law enforcement was able to put out the fire. It's our understanding he's still in critical condition. But this is an individual here, to our understanding, for law enforcement, came here to New York from Florida. He was described as a conspiracy theorist. And I want to be clear from some of his online writings, as well as a pamphlet that he threw onto the ground before setting himself on fire, that he believes in a vast conspiracy that is not necessarily partisan in nature, but one that includes the American government, politicians, financial figures. Uh, this is a, a, a conspiracy theory that is uh, extensive and elaborate and did not have to do directly with the criminal trial happening here in lower Manhattan with Donald Trump, but clearly uh, apparently being targeted because of the mass media that was present for the trial, Tom. 
Okay, Vaughn, let's move on to the trial. Uh, the jury selection is complete. On yeah. to opening statements. The judge uh, just now saying that this trial is going to start on Monday, right? Any hints about what the statements might look like? Opening statements begin Monday. Jury selection was thought to maybe last two weeks, Tom, but here we are. We've got 12 jurors and we got six alternates. And at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, we are expecting the commencement of opening statements from both sides, as well as potentially even the first witness to be called. The cross-examination of that witness will not happen until Tuesday. But on Monday is a notable day. And if you look at some of the focus points for the prosecution, they want to outline the fact that Donald Trump uh, uh, intended to cover up an alleged hush money payment scheme in which Michael Cohen paid Stormy Daniels two weeks before the 2016 election $130,000 to silence her story about her alleged affair. And then in 2017, uh, you, Donald Trump reimbursed allegedly Michael Cohen, uh, hiding those payments, which they say is a crime because he had designated them through Trump organization as legal expenses. And the prosecution wants to make the case that nobody is above the law for the defense. Donald Trump has repeatedly said that this is political persecution, and that he is being unfairly targeted for events that happened eight years ago, and that they intend to undermine the credibility of Stormy Daniels, as well as Michael Cohen, key witnesses who are going to be at the center of the prosecution's testimony. The question is largely what other evidence and testimony is not even public yet that could help the prosecution that the defense team is waiting to have a better understanding of themselves. Um, and, and walk us through these moments in court today when um, I understand several prospective jurors essentially said there's just no way they could serve, right? The amount of scrutiny on these potential jurors, and despite these jurors going to be anonymous, their neighborhoods are revealed, their occupations, their age range is revealed, and there were two individuals that actually broke down crying, the potential jurors, earlier this morning, several noting anxiety. I just want to read you the quote from one of those potential jurors who was very specific when she came before the judge, and she made it clear, Tom, that she felt like that she had re heard from uh, family and friends, and she said that she had anxiety, and she didn't know whether whether she could be here inside of the courtroom. This is going to be a trial that the nation will be watching, and it will last six to eight weeks. They'll be here Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And so you heard from those potential jurors uh, the amount of pressure that undoubtedly those actual 18 that will be coming here on a daily basis will surely feel to some capacity as this, uh, this trial really truly begins on Monday. Yeah, they, uh, they could well become targets. Uh, Vaughn, thank you very much. Vaughn Hilliard. Uh, a breaking update just into us uh, the last couple of minutes. We are learning that Israel has fired three ballistic missiles into Iran. That, according to officials familiar with the operations, it comes as global leaders are calling on both Israel and Iran to refrain from any further attacks that might push the crisis in the Middle East into a wider war after Israel's new retaliatory strike against and inside Iran. I've been um, urging uh, everyone to exercise maximum uh, restraint. Significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. It is absolutely necessary that the region stays stable and that all sides refrain from further action. A source familiar with the action tells NBC News that Israel is assessing the damage from its three strikes against Iran. You can see them right there where those explosions were reported. And this, the latest in the military back and forth with the big remaining question, will Israel launch more attacks and could Iran strike at Israel yet again? We've got team coverage, international correspondent Josh Letterman standing by. NBC's Monica Alba is at the White House. Josh, to you first. Uh, walk us through these brand new details on Israel's attack that we're just getting right now. Yeah, to elaborate on what you were just saying, uh, that comes from our colleague Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon. Uh, this information is not about any new attack, but officials are describing what took place last night. They are putting some meat on the bones in terms of that uh, Israeli strike we saw, saying that it involved uh, three missiles that were shot uh, into Iranian territory. And those officials are also trying to uh, quiet some of the rumors that were out there that Israel had also struck inside Iraq. There was reporting uh, last night that 
potentially there had been uh, Iranian assets in Iraq that were also struck. That would have brought this, of course, to a whole new level uh, because it would mean uh, that potentially Iraq's government would have something to be very upset about. Uh, but these officials say that what actually happened was uh, there was some uh, fragments or debris from the Israeli strike that may have fell inside Iraq, but that there was nothing that was targeted uh, inside Iraq by the Israeli military last night, Tom. You know, Josh, a lot of uh, military analysts have suggested that Iran's attack on Israel was very well telegraphed in, in advance, giving Israel plenty of time to defend itself. And Israel's response really was not, th not that strong. I mean, does it feel to you on the ground that both sides would just rather this whole thing go away right now? I do think the region is taking a bit of a deep breath right now, Tom, uh, and seeing signs from both sides that they felt compelled to respond to show that they can't be messed with, uh, but that they do not want to escalate this into a full-blown war. Case in point, Israel's government has said nothing about these strikes. They are not acknowledging it publicly. They are not rubbing Iran's face in it in a way that could uh, publicly back Iran into a corner where the Iranians might feel compelled to once again retaliate. And the Iranians, who had been silent about this most of the day, just came out with a statement from their foreign ministry where they are obviously condemning the strike. They are calling uh, for no more escalation. But notably, they are not pointing the finger at Israel or anyone else. And so that may be yet another potential off ramp here, Tom. Interesting. Josh, thank you very much. Let's go to Monica now at the White House. Uh, and Monica, the Biden administration trying to tamp down tensions in the region with the defense secretary talking on the phone with Israel's defense minister, right? Exactly, Tom. And all we know really about that conversation is the general topic of discussion was stability in the Middle East. So you can imagine, of course, they're talking about all of these different developments. But in terms of any kind of public posture, the Biden administration has been very tight lipped today, wanting to be very careful, not even wanting to confirm some of these reports or get into many details. It was Secretary Blinken earlier today, who's been traveling overseas, who weighed in simply to say that the United States was not involved in this, and he didn't really want to go beyond that. Here's a little bit more from that appearance. The United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on, what the G7 is focused on, and again, it's reflected in our statement and in our conversation, is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions, um, to de-escalate from any potential conflict. And that's been the president's major priority as well, Tom. And he just left the White House. He is headed out for the weekend. And he did not speak to reporters who certainly were going to try to ask him about this. So continuing that strategy to not want to contribute to anything that could be seen as an escalation or that could broaden this conflict. And we know that the president, in speaking with Prime Minister Netanyahu about a week ago, he had told him that the U.S. would not be a part of any kind of response. But he had also told him to really think carefully and critically about what comes next to be sure that this doesn't provoke something that could be interpreted as, again, an escalation. And so this is an example, really, of what we've seen in this relationship that has at times been quite complicated, where even if the U.S. is giving that kind of advice, it's not clear that Israel is heeding it. But we do know that U.S. and Israeli officials have clearly been in touch, as they almost always are, throughout this conflict. Tom. All right, Monica, thank you very much. New today here at home, the FAA says it's taking action to address the problem of fatigue and exhaustion among air traffic controllers. It's coming after a series of close calls on runways and in the air over the past year and a national shortage of air traffic controllers that has forced many to work mandatory overtime. Just yesterday, we covered a close call at Reagan National Airport when a controller cleared a southwest plane to cross a runway just as a JetBlue flight was starting to uh, roll on a takeoff. The FAA now ordering changes requiring controllers to get 10 hours of rest between shifts. That's more than the nine that are currently required. And if they're working a midnight shift, the FAA wants them to get 12 hours. So this is in line with pilots and flight attendants. The new mandate goes into effect in 90 days. NBC's Maura Barrett on the story today. Maura, these changes really coming ahead of what's expected to be a very busy summer travel season. And the staffing shortages have led some airports already to cut back on the number of flights they accept. 
Exactly. A very, really busy season ahead, and we've already seen a series of close calls, like the one in D.C. that you mentioned uh, in the intro there. And the FAA is investigating whether that has anything to do with a controller, if that was a problem. But as these new rules are being introduced, it really highlights the severe strain that airports are seeing, quite frankly, across uh, the industry. And so the FAA administrator spoke today about the, the goal that they're trying to implement here. Here's some of what he said. Our goal is to have uh, a rested voice on both ends of the microphone. We now have a roadmap to uh, uh, tackling some of these fatigue issues that are in the system. Now, with these new rules being implemented, the National Air Traffic Consol Controllers Association actually pointed out they're welcoming the address, uh, the, the fact that they're trying to address the fatigue, but that they didn't consult, the FAA didn't consult uh, them ahead of time, and they're worried about the fact that they might be short-staffed. Now, in terms of trying to tackle that, the FAA, over the next three days, is opening up new applications uh, for jobs because they are severely understaffed. They're accepting new applications, uh, hoping to hire and train about 1,800 people this year. This is after they added about 1,500 people last year, but that'll still be thousands short of what they say that they need. But overall, these new rules will put controllers in line with rules that pilots and flight attendants have to follow. So the hope is to keep everyone safe when they're around aircraft like this, Tom. Yeah, and you know, something else the FAA is looking at, uh, this incident on a United Airlines flight, a charter flight, after a Colorado Rockies coach posted video of himself in the cockpit in one of the pilot's seats, the captain's seat, during the flight. This appears to be just a clear violation of federal secure cockpit regulations, which do not allow any non-certified, non-authorized person in the cockpit during flight. Yeah, and the FAA has come out strong and reminded the public about that, that this violates the federal regulation in that sense. And even watching the video, it's concerning and, and bizarre just as you're seeing it because you can see the, the captain sitting next to the coach, the Colorado Rocky coach. This happened back on, on April 10th, but it's coming to light now. Um, you see the captain sitting next to him. You can hear voices talking over the video. I want to I show you some of the videos so you can uh, see what, I, what I'm talking about. I'm going to land the plane tonight. <laughs> So very lighthearted attitude there. You can see on both ends of the camera, it's not clear who's uh, taking the video, but you can see, like I said, staff members from the flight in the video as well. United has put out a statement saying that we're deeply disturbed by what we see in that video, which appears to show an unauthorized person in the flight deck at cruise altitude while the autopilot was engaged. And so there is an investigation on both ends looking into this too, Tom. All right, Mara, thank you very much. All right, let's go back to New York with new protests today at Columbia University following protests yesterday that led to 100 arrests of pro-Palestinian activists. Here's the aerial view from New York Station, WNBC, of the activity today at the so-called Gaza Solidarity Encampment. Almost all of those arrested in the last 24 hours have been charged with trespassing, including the daughter of Congresswoman, Rum, pardon me, Congresswoman Ilan Omar, with students on both sides of the issue claiming they feel unsafe on campus. The protests come just days after the university's president testified about allegations of anti-Semitism on campus. Antonia Hilton is outside Columbia right now. Uh, Antonia, what's the relationship right now between the students, many of them encamped, and the administration, the university administration? Tom, it is incredibly tense here on campus. We're on day three of these protests. You can see some of the protests that have spilled out onto the public streets behind me here. The NYPD is still present on campus, but this time they're not out on the lawn and behind the gates. They're here on the street and even arrested one man earlier today. And what the only thing, frankly, that it seems that the administration and the student body can agree on is that this is going to continue and both sides have to be prepared for that. I got the opportunity to actually go behind the gates. They wouldn't let our cameras in there, but I got to see the encampment. There are no tents now at this stage, but students are gathered. They are praying. They've brought supplies and food, and they say they plan to stay there for a long time. Take a listen to some of my conversations first with a pro-Palestinian professor concerned about free speech here on campus, and then with a Jewish student who says that the environment here has been unsafe for kids like him. We were all sitting there watching them. They're sitting there chanting, singing, you know, no one was in any danger. It rarely seems like they're punished. I mean, the NYPD finally getting involved was, that, that, that was a new installation. That hadn't happened before. 
We heard from the university today that they say they plan to enforce their rules around protests going forward. But as of now, they have not invited the NYPD back onto the campus, something that has become a flashpoint here, with even students who previously weren't involved in those protests, Tom, saying that this is an action that made them uncomfortable. Antonia Hilton in New York, thank you very much. New details tonight about the police response to an alleged school shooting plan in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of D.C. The county police chief today expressed gratitude to authorities for working together quickly to thwart what they say could have been a catastrophe. Take a listen. It was a concerned witness who brought this matter to light by reporting the suspect's manifesto to authorities. This underscores the value of community engagement and the see something, say something approach. Police allege 18-year-old Andrea Ye, who goes by the name Alex, wrote a 129-page document that includes a strategy on how to carry out a school shooting. The police chief says it's not the department's goal to make an arrest for every threat it receives, adding the department has about 140 threats it receives to schools in Montgomery County, at least so far this year. NBC's Yamish Alcindor is joining us now. Yamish, 140 threats, this seems like a lot. Uh, why did police feel that they had to arrest, make an arrest on this one. 140 threats really is disturbing, Tom, but police felt like they really had to act in this case because the friend that Alex Yee sent this 129-page document to thought that a shooting was imminent because Alex Yee had had a history of making suicidal and homicidal thoughts very clear to people around him, and he had also spent time in a psychiatric facility. Now, we heard some new information tonight, and that was that there was actually a gun in the home where Alex Yee was living, but that, that one that his father had really made gone to great lengths to make that gun not accessible to him, and also that Maryland laws had really thwarted his ability, any ability, to get a gun for him. Take a listen to what Chief Jones had to say about that today. There was a gun that was locked up in the residence that belongs to the father, uh, but uh, we, our understanding is that uh, the student did not have, um, did not have access and didn't, could not gain access to, to said weapon. And again, I want to underscore that Alex, he also told people that it was hard in his mind to get a gun in Maryland. Now, there is no evidence that he went out to try to buy a gun. Police say the only firearm that he had was a BB gun, but it really does underscore in some ways how much this could have been so much worse. Tom? Yeah, what else have you have you learned about the suspect and how is the community uh, responding? My own, my own kids went to school there in Montgomery County. Well, really, I've talked to a number of people in that community. We've also been in touch with students who knew Alex Yee. They're really all shocked and really scared about what happens next. We also talked to a student there on camera. Take a listen to what they told us. I'm worried because now I don't know what to think. I don't know who in this school is going through something that I might not see. And to be honest, if, and if no one else can see it, I definitely can't. So... It definitely worries me on what might happen tomorrow or the day after that, but I'm hoping that everything will be okay. Now, we should say Alex Yee did, of course, had that, had that history of homicidal and suicidal thoughts, but at least one student who knew Alex also told us that they were surprised that Alex E did this, that there, were, that there was this, this document where he was writing about, he said in a, a work of fiction that he was writing about, though, targeting elementary schools, targeting high schools. So it really does tell you that this is a community that is still processing a lot of this, especially, of course, as we come up on the 25th anniversary of the Columbine High School shooting tomorrow. Thomas? Yeah. I think that student did a great job just kind of uh, encapsulating the fear that so many people have. You don't know what you don't know, and you don't know what you can't see, uh, and that's really of concern for a lot of people. Yamish, thank you. Thank you very much. Yamish Alcindor. Uh, to the south now, we're about 27 million people from Texas to Louisiana are bracing for torrential rain and heavy flooding. The super soaker coming at a time when the region is already dealing with the aftermath of a lot of devastating weather events, tornadoes, extreme Extreme flooding, massive hail. Let's go now to NBC meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, walk us through uh, what it is we're going to see. The worst of it, where can we expect that? 
Yeah, Tom, wouldn't it be nice if we all just had a beautiful spring weekend? I mean, it'd be too easy, right? Uh, unfortunately, you know, today was a quiet day. There's not a lot of bad weather to be found anywhere in the country, but that all changes tonight and then through tomorrow. So this little spinning thing here is where our storm is located. We're already seeing rain and even some snow breaking out in the mountains of Colorado. This will eventually be our storm. It's going to fire storms up early tomorrow morning. So if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you're likely going to wake up to pouring rain and thunderstorms. That races through the south as we go throughout the day on Saturday. Round two comes in Saturday evening. So when you get one heavy rain event after another, plus we had all the storms this week, that's why we're concerned with the flooding potential. Then this last batch will go all the way through the south by the time we get to Saturday. And then by Sunday evening, arriving here in areas of Georgia and South Carolina, of course, the PGA Tours in Hilton Head, they're hopefully going to finish that round before that rain gets in. But that's a possibility to watch. It's not severe weather we're so concerned with. There'll be isolated strong storms in Texas and also here throughout uh, Georgia and also South Carolina, but it's this area that had a lot of rain on and off this week, plus the additional rain we're going to get tomorrow. That's why we're in this slight risk of flash flooding. It's not going to be widespread. It'll be isolated, but there are possibilities that some areas could get up to four, maybe five inches of rain, and that's where we'll get the localized flash flooding. Best shot of that is coming from the Dallas area, right along the interstate, the Tyler, Texas, Shreveport, Monroe included in this too, and towards Jackson, Mississippi. That's kind of the bottom line for the worst chance of flooding. The rest of the country, a little chilly this weekend in the Great Lakes and Northeast, but at least it's not going to be raining. And much of the West is going to be very quiet and warm. It's just that southern portion of the country, Tom, that's going to have issues with wet weather. And unfortunately, probably a lot of rained out spring sports, too. It's that time of year. All right, Bill, thanks very much. Up next from us, the latest place where investigators found bird flu. And here's a hint. It's probably in your fridge, but not in your chicken or your eggs. And they're cute, they look cuddly, and they're about to call this major U.S. city home the return of the pandas when we come back. We're back, bottom of the hour. Tesla is recalling thousands of trucks. We'll tell you why in just a moment. But first from us, a warning from the World Health Organization, which says bird flu has been detected in very high concentrations in raw milk. Health experts say drinking pasteurized milk, which is most common in U.S. grocery stores, that's still safe. Uh, dairy farmers in the U.S. are required to destroy milk from infected cows. So bird flu should not get into the food supply chain in the first place. But bird flu has surged in cows and chickens across the U.S., with animals in 29 farms across eight states affected. That according to the CDC. Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. Uh, Dr. Bird flu's been around for a long time, decades, right? All the way back to World War I, maybe a different variant. But cases now seem to be on the rise again. And we already had a dairy farmer, I guess a worker in Texas who was uh, infected recently, the second in the most recent period of time. Uh, so now it's cows. Any danger we should be worried about? Yeah, no, Tom, probably not. Look, I mean, I, I think at this point, the, the CDC is not concerned about our food supply, and, and they really don't think that there's any, um, you know, immediate risk to the public. And just for context, you know, there have been over 30 million regular influenza cases this year so far, 24,000 deaths from flu. And we've had two cases of avian flu in this country, and both individuals had mild symptoms. We can remind, um, you know, our viewers at home again that the symptoms of avian flu will, will resemble very much the symptoms of regular flu. That's headache, sore throat, achiness, a fever, maybe a pink eye, that kind of thing. But both individuals recovered, uh, you know, without any issue. As you pointed out, there are over two herds um, or two dozen herds, I think, in this country over uh, across eight states um, where, where they noted this. But again, pasteurizing your dairy um, should keep you safe from this. Okay, well, that's great uh, context. Thank you. Uh, don't overreact, in other words. And bird flu has been found, though, as we mentioned, in cows and chickens. We consume a lot of products from those animals, milk, eggs, meat. Uh, should we be taking any steps to make sure that we're safe? Yeah, you know, I, I think if you're traveling to, um, you know, a, a, uh, areas in the Far East, you need to be extremely cautious and avoid going to live bird markets and, and um, bird farms and things like that or coming into contact with any of their fluids. But here at home, make sure that you're cooking your meat, your eggs, your poultry fully mm -hmm. and that you are purchasing and consuming only pasteurized dairy products. And I don't think that you'll need to worry about it. 
Thank you, doctor. Good reality check. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, Natalie. All right. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, the U.N. sounding the alarm over surge, surging dengue fever uh, cases across the north and both North and South America. Now, they're calling it a, quote, emergency situation. The Pan American Health Organization confirms more than five million cases just this year. Argentina and Brazil have been hit the hardest. Dengue fever is transmitted from mosquitoes bites and there's no specific medicine to treat it there is a vaccine but health experts say it's quote very limited number two Apple says it pulled a bunch of messaging apps like whatsapp threads and telegram whatsapp threads and telegram from its app store in China it comes after the government there ordered the takedown due to quote national security concerns according to Apple. Now, the move further escalates tension between the U.S. and China over technology policies there. Apple said it's, quote, obliged and obligated to follow the laws in countries where it, it operates, even when it disagrees. Number three, Tesla recalling more than 3,800 of its cyber trucks. A pad on top of the accelerator can actually cause that pedal to come loose and get stuck. That could lead to unintended acceleration. The company says it plans to replace or fix the pedal free of charge for the owners. Tesla says the recall, of course, is voluntary. Number five, panda diplomacy appears to be back on. A pair of pandas will soon call San Francisco home. Will be on loan thanks to an agreement with the China Wildlife Conservation Association. This comes after partnerships with zoos in Washington, D.C. and Memphis were not renewed. The pandas are expected to arrive at the San Francisco Zoo next year. When we come back, what is the feeling so sudden and new for China's middle class? It's uncertainty. Why some people there are questioning their future. Plus, here's Johnny. We'll take you to the scene of a big fire threatening to take down a historic hotel seen in one of the most iconic movies of all time. That was the clue. We're coming back. You know, we're very busy here at NBC News, covering hundreds of stories each day, and it's awfully tough to read, watch, or listen to everything. So our bureau teams have selected some highlights. This is what they say is going down in their regions, and we call the segment The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, take a look at this surveillance video capturing the terrifying moment a University of Chicago student was robbed at gunpoint. You see her walking back from the class when the man came up to her, flashed his gun. He snatched her phone, but she says she took the magazine out of the gun, tossed it into a bush. That's fast thinking. Police later found both the phone and the magazine. They say three students were actually robbed at gunpoint at the school on the same day. From our Western Bureau, you see it right here, a fire damaging the historic Timberline Lodge in Oregon. If it looks familiar, that's because it's from the horror movie, The Shining. The local fire department says it is now under control, didn't spread beyond the roof or the attic. A lodge employee tells our local affiliate he thinks embers from the main chimney may have caused it. The lodge is set to reopen on Sunday. And out of our Northeast Bureau, in the next couple of hours, this Nigerian chest champion could break the world record for the longest chess marathon, chess marathon. He's playing against an American chess champion right now in Times Square. Where else would you do that? And they're trying to go for 58 hours nonstop. 56 is the current record, if you could stay away. He's trying to raise a million dollars, a million for kids' education in Africa. To tonight's original, we go now in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And after decades of growth that made China the world's second largest economy, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, they're now seeing a bit of a, a slowdown. The Chinese economy is still growing at a rate approaching 5%, but that's down from roughly 7% in the last decade. And it means that the middle class there in China really has less confidence in what the future holds. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer has more. For decades, the growth of China's economy was described as a miracle. Cities, industries, opportunities boomed, fueling the rise of a new and massive middle class. These are less confident days for most of China. 
And much of that middle class is confronting slower growth, an economic slump made more painful by a property crisis, stock market rout, and a youth unemployment rate so high the government last year stopped reporting numbers. <laughs> what it means for Lee Jun Wei is something she thought she'd never encounter uncertainty. In January, she was laid off from an internet company. She's 39 with a mortgage and a toddler. Suddenly, there's no income. What should I do, she says. I still feel quite lost. I get advice from friends and mentors, but I'm constantly looking for solutions. Lee posted a video about what happened to her on social media that went viral. In it, she urged people to put more into life and less into work. Now, to be clear, China's economy is still growing, officially 5% this year, though it's a target some economists regard as ambitious. The way they see it, a recovery here will be driven by Chinese consumer spending. But data show the savings rate hit an all-time high of nearly $20 trillion in February. And consumer confidence is near its lowest point. I don't have breath first anymore. Really? Yeah. It's... To save money? Uh, save money and uh, save more time. Jia Kun Liu is hoping things will get easier. Since getting his film degree in the U.S., he's been eager to work. But here in Beijing, he says there's more competition for fewer jobs. Before, I was paying more attention to my life. But right now, I just pay more, more attention to my like survival. A lot of the nervousness brewing here is among people living in big cities and white-collar workers. Official numbers for layoffs are hard to come by. But one unofficial indicator, more working-age people using libraries. Social media users say they're now hot spots for job searches, applications, or just to have somewhere to go during the day. In Beijing, restaurants that usually offer low-cost meals to seniors say they're now serving a younger crowd. Wang Ron tells us that eating lunch here costs her half of what she would pay at most places, what she calls a downgrade in spending. The rise of a middle class here helped China's government build a reputation for sound economic management. But post-COVID, Beijing has been putting money into backing businesses and industries and not giving a boost to households to get them spending again. It's feeding a trend called reverse consumption. It's sort of like budgeting out loud. My spending philosophy is to save where I can and spend where necessary, says Vika Chen, who works in public relations. She says she and her friends share clothes, travel less, and shop wholesale or discount platforms. She says most people she knows are anxious about stability these days, but that for her, it's a matter of mindset, and she'll manage. Nervousness about the economy here is having a knock-on effect. There's also an increase in Chinese middle-class migration to places like the U.S. The latest figures from the Department of Homeland Security show that the number of people with passports from mainland China crossing into the U.S. without proper paperwork has surged. More than 24,000 Chinese migrants have been detained in the last six months alone. That's up 7,000 percent from the same period three years ago, most of them crossing from Mexico into California. Janice Mickey Freyer in Beijing, thank you. Coming up this hour, Formula One hoping to break new ground right here in the United States. We'll tell you about a high-speed event happening here in D.C. Stay with us. Okay, time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. By the time you check back into the news after the weekend, listen to this, Congress may be one step closer to banning TikTok in the United States. That's because the House included that in a foreign aid for Ukraine bill, Israel and Taiwan. Now, the Senate could pass this next week, and the president has already said he'd sign it. It comes after months of delay, partisan fighting, and a revolt against the House Speaker by some members of his own party. A third House Republican today is signing on to an effort to oust the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, from power. Congressman Paul Gosar joins Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene and Congressman Thomas Massey's motion to vacate the Speaker from the job. They already did that earlier this week, giving them the votes they need to potentially remove the Republican leader unless Democrats step in to save the Republican.
You got that right. But the Speaker, Johnson, says he's not sweating it at all. Take a listen. We'll see what happens. I'm going to do my job. I'm not deterred by threats. And we're going to do the right thing and let the chips fall where they may. All right, NBC Scott Wong joins me now. Scott, boy, this is a weird set of bedfellows, political bedfellows. Who would have ever thought it, right? Uh, there are caveats here, though, right? Even if it makes this trip to the president's desk, this TikTok bill, that doesn't mean TikTok will automatically ban, will it? Well, Tom, that's right. Uh, let's be clear here what we're talking about. Uh, TikTok is catching a ride on this uh, Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel a foreign aid bill, and it really has a lot of momentum. It's going to pass the Senate. President Biden says he will sign it into law. However, uh, on this TikTok bill, uh, there is a, a caveat here that says, uh, you know, it's not an outright ban. What needs to happen is that uh, U.S. lawmakers and the president are giving TikTok uh, their parent company, China-based ByteDance a chance to sell TikTok or divest it uh, and sell it to a U.S. business entity. Uh, they're giving them up to nine months uh, to do that, or else then they will ban it. Uh, the president then can step in and say, look, uh, you know, we'll give you an additional three months. So it's really up to a year before they uh, really will have to uh, sell it or divest it, Tom. All right, let's underscore that for all the TikTokers who are panicking right now. It's not going to happen right away. If it happens at all, it would be nine months to a year down the road, and we'll see how politics plays. But listen, let's get to now the Speaker of the House. Uh, you have known Mr. Johnson personally since 2017. He even called you last fall to tell you he was running for the Speakership. How have you managed to build that relationship over the years? Do you guys go way back? We do. Uh, you know, Speaker Johnson, when he was a backbencher, was really focused on the inside game of Washington, Tom. And I know you know the inside game. Others are focused on the outside game of Washington, being on Twitter, being on TV. That was not uh, Mike Johnson back then. Uh, that allowed him to forge relationships with other lawmakers who he needed uh, their support in order to become speaker. He also forged relationships with reporters. Uh, that allowed him to, to win the support to, to be in this position today. Uh, he did not have a lot of enemies. Things are very much different for Speaker Johnson today. Uh, Scott Wong, who knows how to work his sources and build relationships. Scott, thank you very much. Still to come, are you ready for it? Taylor Swift's new album is out and in typical Taylor fashion, already smashing records. But why are the reviews mixed? We will review the reviews next. Okay, a warning now to my fellow DC viewers and drivers, make sure to check the traffic. There's going to be a speeder down Pennsylvania Avenue with a famous ex-Formula One racer taking over the streets. It's, it's part of a new pitch by the defending F1 champs, Red Bull, to make one of the world's most popular sports more a thing here in the United States. And that's been a years-long endeavor. The U.S. is already home to more F1 races than any other country in Miami, in Austin, Texas, of course, Las Vegas. And our resident F1 expert, you would have never thought it, is Sahil Kapoor. He spoke with David Coltar, the retired driver behind the wheel. He's driven lots of iconic sites and says he wants to add one more. I get the images at the end to sort of, you know, gives me this full life experience. All right. NBC Sahil, Sahil Kapoor joins me now. So tell us about this event tomorrow. We got it here. You, you got a chance to try out what it's like to drive an F1, right? This is your dream. That's right, Tom. This is happening at 4 to 6 p.m. tomorrow. The former Red Bull uh, racing driver, David Coulthard, will race their championship-winning car down Pennsylvania Avenue, just outside the Capitol. They're going to turn that iconic street into a racetrack for one day. Uh, now, I did get to jump into Red Bull's real-life race simulator, which their actual drivers use to hone their craft. It was quite thrilling to see what the drivers see when they zip down those straights at 200 miles an hour to see what it feels like with that heavy braking, to see how agile the cars are around corners. And lucky for me, I got some tips 
from a real-life race winner in David Coulthard while, uh, while I was uh, <laughs> racing that sim. The atmosphere behind me is pretty extraordinary, if you see. I, I rarely see stuff like this uh, in D.C. There are a lot of F1 fans here. Uh, some of them took time off of work from their very busy jobs to come out here and to have fun, Dom. You know what I love about this is we see another side of you, some, a side of you you're passionate about, not just covering Capitol Hill. So let me then combine these two passions. Why does Red Bull, Red Bull rather, want to target D.C.? Is there some sort of lobbying effort underway? Oh, it's a lobbying effort for sure, but it's not a lobbying effort for the government. They're lobbying fans to get fired up about the sport. And if you look behind me, it's clearly working. There are a lot of fans here just uh, right, right behind me. There are fans doing pit stop practice, trying to take off the tires and the wheel guns. Uh, I talked to a whole bunch of fans over here. Some of them are old F1 fans for many years. Some of them are recent F1 fans. Uh, the, the, you know, the recent cocktail of COVID, Netflix's Drive to Survive, and, and an extraordinary thrilling 2021 season has brought a lot of new fans into the sport. I asked David Coulthard why people who aren't F1 fans should care about the sport. He said Americans want the latest and greatest of everything, and that's what F1 is to racing. Let's play what he said. If we look at the world we live in today, most people have a mobile phone or a laptop, and of course you want the latest and greatest because it just enhances your, your performance experience. What you have in Formula One is the fastest, most technologically advanced racing car series in the world. Now, the fans out here, Tom, are decked out in Red Bull gear. They're wearing merch of a whole bunch of teams. They're fans of, of many different teams and drivers here just came here to try to enjoy the Formula One atmosphere. In fact, I ran into a political source just about an hour ago who says he secretly took off work. He's not supposed to be here. I did agree to keep his uh, identity anonymous. <laughs> well, you, you took off work, too, but I guess we roped you into a live shot. Let's talk about the popularity. We know F1's owner is a U.S.-based company, the same company that owns the Atlanta Braves. And as you've reported, F1 viewership last season went up uh, to a record, uh, I think it was a million viewers on ESPN, is that right? A double five years ago. But behind ESPN's other properties, like the NBA, MLB, and way behind Monday Night Football. So is this a critical year, then, for the F1? ...to preserve the recent growth of the fan base, and their second goal is to expand it. Now, it's going to be very difficult to expand it, just given the extraordinary growth they've had recently, but that's why they're doing events like this, to give people an up-close and personal look at the cars, at, you know, one of the former drivers, and to get to experience what's happening right behind me, pit stop practice. Okay, uh, there you go. Sahil's passion uh, is right behind him. And have you heard of another passion out there? Taylor Swift's highly anticipated new album, The Tortured Poets Department, is out and already breaking records, becoming Spotify's most streamed album in a single day this year. It is a big day for Swifties. That's their passion. The album, the pop superstar's 11th, dropped at midnight, but Swift surprised fans at 2 a.m. when she released another 15 songs making this a double album, 31 songs in total. Some fans and critics, though, say that this might not be her best work, and it's all just too much swift. Let's get now to NBC's Emily Akeda, our own in-house Swifty. Uh, Emily, uh, Swift has been releasing this constant stream of music, five new albums plus four pre-recorded ones as well since 2019 alone. Her record-breaking Eras tour is a three-and-a-half-hour marathon, 40-plus songs. I watched it. It was great. But give us a vibe check. Is Taylor Swift overexposed? Does this do more harm than good? Yeah, it really is quite stunning, especially when you see all of the albums in picture form there to show the amount of work, just how prolific of an artist that she is. You know, I, I think we've heard from some critics that, OK, they asked the question, is 31 songs too much? Could we have done with less or could have some of the stronger songs hit even harder had it been on a shorter track list? I guess it depends who you ask. A lot of fans will point out, well, look, this is a prolific artist and this is a trend and something that is just a part of her. She's always been known to release an immense amount of music. Take a look at the 10-minute version of All Too Well, or as, as you mentioned, her marathon of a concert, three and a half hours plus, that she continues to take around the world. Taylor Swift writing uh, on Instagram. Take a look at this. She says, I'd written so much tortured poetry in the past two years and wanted to share it all with you. So here's the second installment of TTPD, the anthology. It is two hours and two minutes of music, Tom. 
She is so talented and she is so prolific. How did this break new grounds in terms of marketing, though? And I think the question is going to be, is it paying off? I mean, she really is a marketing genius, so much so that is literally be, being studied by various college courses. You take a look, she has teased this months ago and have been dropping uh, hints and lyrics at the Grammys, even uh, at various exhibits since then, building up this hype. And now, as you mentioned, it is already breaking uh, various records just hours since it's been released, Tom. Oh, I heard screaming in my house this morning, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> early this morning. All right, Emily, thank you very much. Uh, that is a wrap for this hour, but the coverage on News Now continues right now. Top of our second hour here on News Now, and we start with that breaking news out of New York on a busy Friday. A man setting himself on fire almost at the exact same time the jury is seated in Donald Trump's historic trial. The man in critical condition, and what we are hearing from police and witnesses at the scene, live with our reporter who saw it all go down. We are also live with new details on those strikes by Israel on Iran that we're learning about in the last hour or so. Leaders both here and abroad call on both sides now to take down the temperature or breaking down what the U.S. expects might happen next. Plus, millions bracing for flooding across the South. This is not a repeat on a Friday. It's constantly happening. We'll get the forecast on the super soaker event coming from Bill. And then the new FAA action tackling just how tired so many air traffic controllers are as they are trying to find out how a baseball coach entered the cockpit of a United Airlines flight sitting in a captain's seat. Are you kidding me? And the new warning about bird flu found in raw milk, what health experts want you to know later in the show. Good day and happy Friday. I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie at this hour, and we are starting with that terrifying scene outside the first of its kind trial of a former president, a man apparently setting himself on fire just steps from the courthouse where the jury today was selected to decide Donald Trump's fate. We warn you, some of the images here uh, are disturbing for many. You see a man on fire, caught from a distance right there, a significant difference. Our cameras were on the scene with our team watching all of this chaos, including the police who rushed over to see what was happening and used a fire extinguisher. Uh, this area was set up specifically for four protesters. As you can see here, the papers that the man had, he was throwing them up in the air. Police had to grab them and, and try to collect them on the scene. Uh, no indication that says anything at all to do with the trial. The NYPD says it may now have to beef up security. Take a listen. This gentleman did not breach the security protocols. The park was open to the public. But of course, we're going to look at everything and with the magnitude of what's going on around right here, we'll reassess our security with our federal partner. Okay, again, this appears to be unrelated to Mr. Trump's trial. We'll have more on this in just a moment. But let's talk about the trial. The players picked, we're ready to go. Six alternate jurors in the Trump trial. You see them right here. And now this is important. Uh, they will likely spend the next two months or so on standby in case there's any conflict with any of the other 12 jurors who will decide whether Mr. Trump is guilty on 34 counts of lying on his business records, allegedly making hush money payments to the former adult film star named Stormy Daniels, and you've heard her name many times in the past. Mr. Trump denying that he had a sexual relationship with her. This day underscores the stress potential jurors are facing. Two prospective jurors actually broke down in tears on the stand, as just in the last hour we are hearing the former president again promising to testify during this trial. NBC's Von Hilliard is outside the courthouse in Manhattan. He's had a very eventful day, and Von will talk about the trial, but first set the scene for us on this scary moment earlier. You were right. there when this fire broke out. What are you now hearing from witnesses about who this person was? Right. It was an intense and difficult scene, and one, just for the timing purposes here, came just literally two, three minutes after the final alternate jurors were sworn in inside the courtroom while Donald Trump was still outside. And this man set himself ablaze just about 100 yards from the front entrance, from the front doors of the courthouse. I want to let you hear from Ed Quinn. He's a freelance photographer who was nearby and was watching immediately as those first moments unfolded. Take a listen. 
Police looked for a fire extinguisher. Uh, it took about a minute or so to get there. They put one fire extinguisher, emptied it on him. Another 30 seconds or so, another one arrived. He was still on fire. There were people screaming, uh, put him out, put him out. There were people crying. Tom, we are here outside of the courthouse all day covering the trial inside, and it was very difficult to watch uh, this man take upon this act upon himself in, in real time here. Upon looking into this individual, authorities here during a press conference affirmed that this man is from Florida. His family was unaware that he was here in New York. He's in his early 30s. He is in critical condition at a nearby burn center. Uh, this man, apparently from his online writings as well as pamphlets that he had thrown into the air moments before setting himself on fire, uh, believes in a vast conspiracy theory, a, a network that involves the American government, politicians, major financial figures, universities. This is, it was not apparently a, a partisan act. He's not necessarily on the side of Donald Trump or Joe Biden, but he used this event here to call attention with such the mass media that is a, a presence here for the criminal trial, Tom. Uh, Vaughn, that's that in and of itself is a very difficult story to uh, to follow and to track. But let's talk about uh, now our colleague, uh, Laura Jarrett, pointed out something very important here in our tracks legal slack channel. She said this whole jury selection process today is sort of like this mini political focus group for the former president. Can you give us a bit more detail on that? What does she mean? It really is. I mean, each of these potential jurors, and now the 18 that are officially going to be jurors, went through an extensive 42-question questionnaire, but also direct questions from the prosecutors and the defense team, who even looked into their past social media presences. And you heard folks, one individual called Donald Trump, usually amazing, right, praising his policies. You saw another individual who noted that there is a great following of Americans who are led to make statements that that are hateful towards other individuals because of Donald Trump. You heard another individual call him an insurrectionist. You heard multiple individuals today say that they had anxiety from the amount of attention that they were receiving from family and friends and colleagues and that they didn't feel comfortable being on the jury here. This is uh, you know, more than a high profile, more than a celebrity case. This is one involving a former president of the United States and the presumptive Republican nominee to be the future president of the United States. And these were New Yorkers who, like anybody across America, America that gets jury summons uh, did not intend to be here for this moment, but they were randomly selected and then they were the ones that faced serious questions from prosecutors and defense team. And ultimately, we have 18 human beings that are going to be the ones that determine whether Donald Trump is guilty or not. And they have to put their lives on hold uh, indefinitely, right? And I understand the first few days uh, starting Monday will be half days. Right. Passover, uh, 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 Passover next week has led the judge to determine that court will be out of session beginning at 2 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday. But this is a trial that could last anywhere from six to seven weeks here. So this is going to be a commitment Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays for these jurors here in which uh, the obligation of determining Donald Trump's guilty or innocence is going to be on the line. Uh, uh, this is a, a big moment in American history and a big moment for the immediate future of the Republican. Republican Party here is their nominee for president. Uh, the legal uh, fate of his is going to lie in the hands of these 12 individuals. Yep. Vaughn, thank you very much. Vaughn Hilliard on the story for us in New York. A breaking update just into us in the last couple of minutes. We are learning Israel fired three ballistic missiles into Iran overnight, not recently. That, according to officials familiar with the operations. A and it comes as global leaders are calling on both Israel and Iran to refrain from any further attacks that might push the crisis in the Middle East into a wider war after Israel's new retaliatory strike against and inside Iran. Listen to this. And I've been um, urging uh, everyone to exercise maximum uh, restraint. Significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. It is absolutely necessary that the region stays stable and that all sides refrain from further action. Global leaders calling for calm, a source familiar with the action telling NBC News that Israel is assessing the damage from its missile strikes against Iran. You can see right there where those explosions were reported. And this in the latest in the military back and forth with the big remaining question, will Israel launch more attacks? 
Could Iran strike at Israel again? We've got team coverage, international correspondent Josh Letterman standing by, Monica Alba standing by at the White House. Josh, what more do we know now about Israel's attack here? And importantly, what could happen next? Are you getting any read on that? Well, Tom, there had been some question about the full scope of Israel's strike in Iran last night. Now, officials tell our Pentagon correspondent, Courtney Kuby, uh, that the Israeli strike involved uh, three missiles. Uh, so that speaks to the fairly limited scope of this strike compared to the some 300 plus uh, missiles and drones that Iran sent into Israel uh, just a few nights before. We're also learning that despite some reports that Israel had also targeted sites in Iraq, uh, that there was no explosion. No missiles launched into Iraq. In fact, what there was, according to these officials, were parts of those missiles that Israel was sending into Iran uh, instead fell into Iraq, essentially, as they were uh, making their way toward Iran. And so that means uh, that we don't have to worry about uh, Iraq potentially feeling like it has been pulled into this conflict uh, in the same way as if it had been targeted as well. And really, the, the unanimous message we're hearing from countries around the world right now, Tom, is everybody chill out. It is a message of a restraint, uh, of de-escalation. Uh, all nations from Egypt and Jordan, which border Israel, uh, to the United Nations, urging both of these countries right now not to use this as the occasion to once again escalate and potentially uh, to bring this up into a full-scale war. Hey, Josh, it really feels uh, from the perspective here across the ocean that this was a very limited response from Israel, right? Three rockets compared to 300 yeah. incoming rockets from uh, Iran. And even on those Iranian rockets and drones and missiles, they well telegraphed what they were going to do hours and days in advance, giving the Israelis plenty of time to prepare. It, it kind of feels like this whole thing has just been kind of for show, uh, and nobody really wanted there to be mass casualties, and nobody wanted to start a conflagration. Kind of feels like kabuki theater in a way, doesn't it, Tom? The military strikes were limited, and now the public response from both of these countries has been limited, which may be yet another indication that while they felt they had to act to show publicly uh, that they are not going to uh, take this kind of action from their enemy, that neither side wants to escalate uh, into a full-scale war. The Ara Ara Israelis have said almost nothing about the strike today. They're not taking credit. They are not uh, gloating over this or rubbing it in the Iranian faces, and the Iranians have not even pointed the finger at Israel for striking in their territory. The Iranians usually blame Israel for anything, even if it's not necessarily something that they did. Uh, and so we see on both sides what appears to be uh, signals uh, that they do not at this point want to escalate further, and that is giving some hope uh, to countries around the world that this may be the end of this uh, immediate round of conflict, that we may have averted that tit-for-tat escalation spiraling conflict that could lead into a full-scale war that everybody has been so scared about, Tom. And you are headed into the Sabbath right there. All right, Josh, thank you very much. Let's go to Monica Alba with the view from the White House at this hour. And Monica, the White House, uh, pretty tight-lipped about this new strike, right? Talk about the calculations uh, it is making as the Biden administration really wants to de-escalate the situation. That's the main priority here, absolutely, Tom. And the president did have an opportunity if he wanted to take questions from reporters before leaving for Delaware for the weekend a short time ago, but he decided not to, instead heading straight for Marine One. And earlier this afternoon, when the White House press secretary was asked to weigh in on these developments, she said she really couldn't comment on the reports about a dozen times, saying that she just wasn't going to speak to any of these diplomatic discussions, because we know there have likely been these back-channel conversations with various various countries about how Israel did respond to Iran and what might come next. So this is by design. It's intentional. They're being very, very careful in what they can and cannot say. And we saw a preview of that from Secretary Blinken earlier today when he was talking about this during overseas travel. Listen. The United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on, what the G7 is focused on, and again, it's reflected in our statement, and in our conversation, is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions, um, to de-escalate from any potential conflict. And that is exactly why you're seeing the administration and the Pentagon, the White House, other agencies, the State Department just there be so careful in their rhetoric, Tom, because they want to make sure that nothing they say or do here could potentially further inflame an already fraught situation.
Hey, Monica, we are just now getting new sound. This is an interview uh, that our Tom Yamas did with Iran's foreign minister. Let's play that out. When you attacked Israel, you telegraphed that attack. You let other Arab nations know this was happening. Did anyone, any other country, tell Iran last night that this attack was happening? What happened last night was not a, a strike. But did any other country tell you something was happening and they were going to invade your airspace and attack possibly your bases? The two or three, very, <laughs> they're, they're like more like toys that our children play with, not drones. It was not worth telling us before it happened. Really sounds, Monica, like the Iranian foreign minister is trying to downplay what the Israelis did last night, saying that they're toys, that it was not a strike. Uh, it sounds like he's really trying to talk down this whole thing and, and, and cool, cool tensions. Yes, diplomatically, that would be my assessment as well, Tom. I think what's notable there is that when we did see about a week ago Iran launched their response to Israel, it was something like 300 missiles and drones. And now we are learning that, of course, the response from Israel last night was more like three, a handful. And you saw there that that Iranian foreign minister even wouldn't call it a strike necessarily yeah. and did compare it to, in his words, that those weapons were more like child's toys than anything else. So I think because Israel is not coming out and saying very much on this either, and with Iran dismissing it in effect in terms of what it was able to accomplish or not accomplish, we don't have the best sense of that yet. That is an indication here that the U.S. has taken this approach, similarly of saying very little, again, to bring all of that down to ensure that tensions do not get further inflamed. That has been a major priority for the president. And it was in his conversation with Prime Minister Netanyahu a week ago that he told him, please think very carefully and critically about whatever you do here next, because we don't want this to explode into anything more serious. Monica Tom. Alba at the White House, thank you very much. You can watch more of Tom Yamas' sit-down interview with Iran's foreign minister tonight on NBC Nightly News, and also right here on NBC News Now, top story with Tom Yamas immediately following this broadcast. New today, the FAA says it's taking action to address the problem of fatigue and exhaustion among air traffic controllers. It's coming after a series of close calls on runways and in the air over the past year and a national shortage of air traffic controllers that has forced many to work mandatory overtime. Just yesterday, we covered a close call at Reagan National Airport when a controller cleared a Southwest plane to cross a runway just as a JetBlue plane was starting its takeoff roll. The FAA now ordering changes, requiring controllers to get 10 hours of rest between shifts rather than nine currently required. And if they're working a midnight shift, the FAA wants them to get 12 hours of rest in advance. The new FAA mandate goes into effect in 90 days. NBC's Maura Barrett uh, joining me now. Now and more at the National Air Traffic Controllers Association is worried that these rules could backfire, right? Because essentially you're aggravating the situation without enough controllers. Exactly. And there's already not enough controllers, as we know, Tom, because there's been backups. There's been the mandatory overtimes that you mentioned and spacing out worker schedules like this, making sure they have enough rest while makes sense for workers ability to act safely while on the job is going to create an even bigger staffing issue. And that's essentially what they said uh, in a statement, pointing out that this could create coverage hold, ho holes, saying that requiring controllers to work mandatory overtime to fill those holes would even more so increase fatigue and make the new policy nothing more than window dressing. So kind of uh, a very direct hit against what the FAA is doing. They did say that the FAA didn't consult with them ahead of time, uh, though they do appreciate the fact that they're trying to address worker fatigue. The issue is, again, the staffing. Now, the FAA is trying to tackle that. They're opening up the window for applications over the next three days. They're trying to hire and train 1,800 more workers this year. This is after uh, they hired and trained 1,500 workers last year. Uh, and so, but there is still going to be about a thousands of thousands of workers shortage uh, that are still playing into to this overall issue, Tom. Yeah, and the other big issue that the FAA is dealing with now is this incident on the United Airlines flight after a Colorado Rockies baseball coach posted a video of himself inside the cockpit in one of the pilot's seats during flight. This appears to be a clear violation of federal secure cockpit regulations. 
That's what it looks like, and the FAA is investigating that. You see in that video there, this was a chartered flight back on April 10th, the Colorado Rockies uh, hitting coach there in the, the pilot seat. You see the captain or, or one of the officers sitting next to him in that video. Obviously very bizarre and concerning, a safety issue. United said that they're deeply disturbed by what they see in that video, which appears to show an unauthorized person in the flight deck at, while, cruise, at, while at cruise altitude while the autopilot is engaged. And so the video has since been taken down. Uh, but the FAA is looking into how this could have happened in the first place, Tom. Yeah, and let's remind the audience that these secure cockpit rules uh, were were essentially created after 9-11, right, when we had all these mm -hmm. uh, international terrorists intentionally crashing planes. Uh, Maura, thank you very much for your reporting on that one. Let's go back to New York now with new protests today at Columbia University following protests yesterday that led to 100 arrests of pro-Palestinian activists. Here's the aerial view from New York today, our station WNBC, looking at the so-called Gaza Solidarity encampment. Almost all of those arrests in the last 24 hours charged with trespassing, including the daughter of Congresswoman Ila Omar, with students on both sides of this issue claiming that they feel unsafe on campus. The protests coming just days after the university's president testified about allegations of anti-Semitism at Columbia. Antonia Hilton is outside of Columbia University. Uh, Antonia, what's the relationship right now between the students, many of them encamped, and the administration, the university administration? Tom, it is incredibly tense here on campus. We're on day three of these protests. You can see some of the protests that have spilled out onto the public streets behind me here. The NYPD is still present on campus, but this time they're not out on the lawn and behind the gates. They're here on the street and even arrested one man earlier today. And what the only thing, frankly, that it seems that the administration and the student body can agree on is that this is going to continue and both sides have to be prepared for that. I got the opportunity to actually go behind the gates. They wouldn't let our cameras in there, but I got to see the encampment. There are no tents now at this stage, but students are gathered. They are praying. They've brought supplies and food, and they say they plan to stay there for a long time. Take a listen to some of my conversations first with a pro-Palestinian professor concerned about free speech here on campus, and then with a Jewish student who says that the environment here has been unsafe for kids like him. We were all sitting there watching them. They're sitting there chanting, singing, you know, no one was in any danger. It rarely seems like they're punished. I mean, the NYPD finally getting involved was, that, that, that was a new installation. That hadn't happened before. We heard from the university today that they say they plan to enforce their rules around protests going forward. But as of now, they have not invited the NYPD back onto the campus, something that has become a flashpoint here, with even students who previously weren't involved in those protests, Tom, saying that this is an action that made them uncomfortable. Antonia Hilton in New York, thank you very much. New details tonight about the police presence and response to an alleged school shooting plan in Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside of D.C. The county police chief today expressed gratitude for authorities, to authorities, for working together to thwart what could have been a catastrophe. Take a listen. It was a concerned witness who brought this matter to light by reporting the suspect's manifesto to authorities. This underscores the value of community engagement and the see something, say something approach. Police allege 18-year-old Andre Yi, who goes by the name of Alex, wrote a 129-page document that includes a strategy of how to carry out a school shooting. The police chief says it's not the department's goal to make an arrest for every threat it receives adding that the Montgomery County Police Department has received 140 threats to schools in the county so far this year. NBC's Yamish Alcindor is joining us now. Yamish, 140 threats? This seems like a lot. Uh, why did police feel that they had to arrest, make an arrest on this one? 140 threats really is disturbing, Tom, but police felt like they really had to act in this case because the friend that Alex Yee sent this 129-page document to thought that a shooting was imminent because Alex Yee had had a history of making suicidal and homicidal thoughts very clear to people around him, and he had also spent time in a psychiatric facility. Now, we heard some new information tonight, and that was that there was actually a gun in the home where Alex Yee was living, but that, that one that his father had really made 
gone to great lengths to make that gun not accessible to him. And also that Maryland laws had really thwarted his ability, any ability to get a gun for him. Take a listen to what Chief Jones had to say about that today. There was a gun that was locked up in the residence that belongs to the father. Uh, but uh, we, our understanding is that uh, the student did not have um, did not have access and didn't, could not gain access to, to said weapon. And again, I want to underscore that Alex, he also told people that it was hard in his mind to get a gun in Maryland. Now, there is no evidence that he went out to try to buy a gun. Police say the only firearm that he had was a BB gun, but it really does underscore in some ways how much this could have been so much worse. Tom? Yeah, what else have you have you learned about the suspect and how is the community uh, responding? My own my own kids went to school there in Montgomery County. Well, really, I've talked to a number of people in that community. We've also been in touch with students who knew Alex. He, they're really all shocked and really scared about what happens next. We also talked to a student there on camera. Take a listen to what they told us. I I'm worried because now I don't know what to think. I don't know who in this school is going through something that I might not see, and to be honest, if and if no one else can see it, I definitely can't. So it definitely worries me on what might happen tomorrow or the day after that, but I'm hoping that everything will be okay. Now, we should say Alex he did, of course, had that, had that history of homicidal and suicidal thoughts, but at least one student who knew Alex also told us that they were surprised that Alex E. did this, that there were that there was this, this document where he was writing about, he said in a, in a work of fiction that he was writing about, though, targeting elementary schools, targeting high schools. So it really does tell you that this is a community that is still processing a lot of this, especially, of course, as we come up on the 25th anniversary of the Columbine High School shooting tomorrow. Thomas? Yeah. I think that student did a great job just kind of uh, encapsulating the fear that so many people have. You don't don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you can't see uh, and that's really of concern for a lot of people. Yamish, thank you. Thank you very much. Yamish Alcindor. To the south we go now. About 27 million people from Texas to Louisiana are bracing for torrential rain and heavy flooding. The super soaker comes at a time when the region is already dealing with the aftermath of a lot of devastating weather events, tornadoes, extreme flooding, massive hail. Let's go to NBC meteorologist Bill Karens. Oh, Bill, <laughs> here yeah. we go again. Uh, <laughs> all right, walk us, walk us through it, right? What, where are we going to be looking at the biggest problems? Yeah, you hate ruining spring weekends, right? I mean, you go through a whole winter and you're looking forward to the spring and getting things done and outdoors. And then I unfortunately got a forecast like this for some of you, not all. So here's the storm we're talking about. It's coming out of Arizona. By the time we get through tomorrow morning, everything's kind of fine tonight. Tomorrow morning, watch right here. All these storms and all that rain explodes right over Dallas and Fort Worth early in the day. Then during the day, it moves through the south. Then round two starts. We've already had some significant rain this week with all the storms. So we're going to get another two. Two rounds of rain and thunderstorms. That's why we're concerned with the potential, at least, of some isolated significant flash flooding. And then by Sunday, this last wave heads all the way through Georgia and South Carolina. So we're not so concerned with severe storms. That's good. The you know, tornado threat is very low. We may get some small hail out of these storms, some lightning, but we're not only in the marginal risk. We're not even in the slight risk category. You know, remember that goes all the way up to the high risk. So we're okay there. But this is the area of concern. Oh, a good chunk of central and east Texas here. It's at a slight risk for flash flooding. That's because the ground is wet. We're getting more rain, and it does look like we could see locally up to about four inches of rain from Dallas heading towards Shreveport into northern Louisiana. So as I said, Tom, that's the problem areas. Northeast, Great Lakes, Rockies, all through the southwest looking fantastic this weekend. Everyone else's plans look good. Apologies from Texas all the way down through the southeast. Oh, that's all you got? We're stopping right there. I don't want any more bad news. All right, buddy. Thank you. We'll save it for next week. <laughs> Good. Next week. Bill, thank you. All right. Well, let's pick up on the theme here. Torrential rains become deadly, bringing flash floods to a part of the world usually known for its dry, hot climate. Plus, one woman who sent Harry Styles 8,000 cards in a single month learns her fate. There's a tease. Stay with us. Bottom of the hour, back now to a warning from the World Health Organization, which says bird flu has been detected in very high concentrations in raw milk. Health experts say drinking pasteurized milk, which is most common in the United States grocery stores, that it's still safe. 
Dairy farmers in the U.S. are required to destroy milk from infected cows, so bird flu should not get into the food supply chain in the first place. But bird flu has surged in cows and chickens throughout the United States. Animals at 29 farms across eight states affected that, according to the CDC. Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. Dr. Bird flu's been around for a long time, decades, right? All the way back to World War I, maybe a different variant. The cases now seem to be on the rise again, and we already had a dairy farmer, I guess a worker in Texas who was uh, infected recently, the second in the most recent period of time. Uh, so now it's cows. Any danger we should be worried about? Yeah, no, Tom, probably not. Look, I mean, I think at this point, the, the CDC is not concerned about our food supply, and, and they really don't think that there's any, um, you know, immediate risk to the public. And just for context, you know, there have been over 30 million regular influenza cases this year so far, 24,000 deaths from flu. And we've had two cases of avian flu in this country, and both individuals had mild symptoms. We can remind, um, you know, our viewers at home again that the symptoms of avian flu will, will resemble very much the symptoms of regular flu. That's headache, sore throat, achiness, a fever, maybe a pink eye, that kind of thing. But both individuals recovered, uh, you know, without any issue. As you pointed out, there are over two herds um, or two dozen herds, I think, in this country over uh, across eight states um, where, where they noted this. But again, pasteurizing your dairy um, should keep you safe from this. Okay, well, that's great uh, context. Thank you. Uh, don't overreact, in other words. And bird flu has been found, though, as we mentioned, in cows and chickens. We consume a lot of products from those animals, milk, eggs, meat. Uh, should we be taking any steps to make sure that we're safe? Yeah, you know, I, I think if you're traveling to, um, you know, a, a, uh, areas in the Far East, you need to be extremely cautious and avoid going to live bird markets and, and um, bird farms and things like that or coming into contact with any of their fluids. But here at home, make sure that you're cooking your meat, your eggs, your poultry fully mm -hmm. and that you are purchasing and consuming only pasteurized dairy products. And I don't think that you'll need to worry about it. Thank you, doctor. Good reality check. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, you, Natalie. All right, over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Uh, here are some headlines. Number one, the U.N. sounding the alarm over surging dengue fever cases across North and South America. They are calling it a, quote, emergency situation. The Pan American Health Organization confirms more than five million cases just this year. Argentina and Brazil getting hit the hardest. Dengue fever is transmitted from mosquitoes, uh, from bites, and most people get better after a few days, but in rare cases, it can be deadly. Number two, a woman in London convicted for stalking pop star Harry Styles, now sentenced to 14 weeks behind bars. The 35-year-old sent Styles 8,000 greeting cards over less than a month. As part of her guilty plea, she will also have to stay away from Styles for the next 10 years because of a restraining order. Number three, Tesla recalling more than 3,800 of its cyber trucks. A pad on top of the accelerator pedal can apparently come loose and get stuck. That can lead to unattended acceleration. The company says it plans to replace or fix the pedal free of charge for owners. Tesla says that recall is voluntary. Number four, we've all heard people say that eating within limited hours might help with weight loss, but now we're getting some clues as to why. A new small study from Johns Hopkins University says it, it might be because you're just eating less rather than the actual timing of your meals. But the lead researcher does say the study might not fully capture the long-term benefits of time-restricted eating. Number five, panda diplomacy back on. A pair of pandas will soon call San Francisco home. They'll be on loan thanks to an agreement with the Chinese government, the Wildlife Conservation Association there. This comes after partnerships with zoos in Washington, D.C. and Memphis were not renewed. The pandas are expected to arrive at the San Francisco Zoo next year. When we come back, an economy faltering, millions of people losing confidence. We're going to take you to China in a very interesting story coming up next. And then how a viral video led to some star runners being stripped of their medals. Stay with us.
NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. It's awfully tough to read, watch, or listen to all of them. So our teams around the world have selected some highlights. Here's a look at what they're watching, and we call it the global. From Pakistan, at least 69 people are dead. Dozens hurt after heavy rains and flooding. That according to disaster management teams there, you can see water pooled on the streets, homes destroyed. Parts of Pakistan could see more intense rain over the next few days. Out of China, huge scandal from the Beijing Half Marathon. Organizer stripping the first place winner of his victory, along with the next three runners up. This investigation apparently discovered three African runners slowed down just before the finish line, so the winner, who is from China, could come out on top. One of those runners tells the BBC they were running as pacemakers not to compete. The four runners now have to turn in their medals and their money. From India we go now. Uh, researchers just discovered an ancient giant snake that lived there like 15 million years ago. It might have been longer than a school bus. You can see the reptile here. They say the snake might have stretched to like 50 feet long, but that's even longer than the largest snake alive today. And they say it could weigh more than a ton, might have weighed more than a ton. Thankfully, it doesn't live anymore. Just some nightmare to fuel tonight. All right, now to tonight's original in-depth reporting on a topic we like to keep a top, uh, watch on. rather. After decades of growth that made China the world's second largest economy and lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty, they're now seeing a bit of a slowdown in China. The Chinese economy, economy is still growing at a rate approaching 5%. That's really good. But it's down from about 7% over the last decade. And that means that middle class folks in China have less confidence in what their future might look like. Here's NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer. For decades, the growth of China's economy was described as a miracle. Cities, industries, opportunities boomed, fueling the rise of a new and massive middle class. These are less confident days for most of China. And much of that middle class is confronting slower growth, an economic slump made more painful by a property crisis, stock market rout, and a youth unemployment rate so high the government last year stopped reporting numbers. What it means for Li Junwei is something she thought she'd never encounter, uncertainty. In January, she was laid off from an internet company. She's 39 with a mortgage and a toddler. Suddenly, there's no income. What should I do, she says. I still feel quite lost. I get advice from friends and mentors, but I'm constantly looking for solutions. Lee posted a video about what happened to her on social media that went viral. In it, she urged people to put more into life and less into work. Now, to be clear, China's economy is still growing, officially 5% this year, though it's a target some economists regard as ambitious. The way they see it, a recovery here will be driven by Chinese consumer spending. But data show the savings rate hit an all-time high of nearly $20 trillion in February. And consumer confidence is near its lowest point. I don't have breath first anymore. Really? Yeah. It's, to save money? Uh, save money and uh, save more time. Jia Kun Liu is hoping things will get easier. Since getting his film degree in the U.S., he's been eager to work. But here in Beijing, he says there's more competition for fewer jobs. Before, I was paying more attention to my life. But right now, I just pay more, more attention to my like survival. A lot of the nervousness brewing here is among people living in big cities and white collar workers. Official numbers for layoffs are hard to come by. But one unofficial indicator, more working age people using libraries. Social media users say they're now hot spots for job searches, applications, or just to have somewhere to go during the day. In Beijing, restaurants that usually offer low-cost meals to seniors say they're now serving a younger crowd. Wang Ron tells us that eating lunch here costs her half of what she would pay at most places, what she calls a downgrade in spending. The rise of a middle class here helped China's government build a reputation for sound economic management. But post-COVID, Beijing has been putting money into backing businesses and industries and not giving a boost to households to get them spending again. 
It's feeding a trend called reverse consumption. It's sort of like budgeting out loud. My spending philosophy is to save where I can and spend where necessary, says Vika Chen, who works in public relations. She says she and her friends share clothes, travel less, and shop wholesale or discount platforms. She says most people she knows are anxious about stability these days, but that for her is a matter of mindset and she'll manage. Nervousness about the economy here is having a knock-on effect. There's also an increase in Chinese middle-class migration to places like the U.S. The latest figures from the Department of Homeland Security show that the number of people with passports from mainland China crossing into the U.S. without proper paperwork has surged. More than 24,000 Chinese migrants have been detained in the last six months alone. That's up 7,000 percent from the same period three years ago, most of them crossing from Mexico into California. Janice Mickey Freyer in Beijing, thank you. Coming up this hour, Formula One hoping to break new ground right here in the United States. We'll tell you about a high-speed event happening here in D.C. Stay with us. Okay, time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. By the time you check back into the news after the weekend, listen to this Congress may be one step closer to banning TikTok in the United States. That's because the House included that in a foreign aid for Ukraine bill, Israel and Taiwan. Now, the Senate could pass this next week. And the president has already said he'd sign it. It comes after months of delay, partisan fighting, and a revolt against the House Speaker by some members of his own party. A third House Republican today is signing on to an effort to oust the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, from power. Congressman Paul Gosar joins Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene and Congressman Thomas Massey's motion to vacate the Speaker from the job. They already did that earlier this week, giving them the votes they need to potentially remove the Republican leader unless Democrats step in to save the Republican. You got that right. But the Speaker Johnson says he's not sweating it at all. Take a listen. We'll see what happens. I'm going to do my job. I'm not deterred by threats. And we're going to do the right thing and let the chips fall where they may. All right, NBC Scott Wong joins me now. Scott, boy, this is a weird set of bedfellows, political bedfellows. Who would have ever thought it, right? Uh, there are caveats here, though, right? Even if it makes this trip to the president's desk, this TikTok bill, that doesn't mean TikTok will automatically ban, will it? Well, Tom, that's right. Uh, let's be clear here what we're talking about. Uh, TikTok is catching a ride on this uh, Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel uh, foreign aid bill. And it really has a lot of momentum. It's going to pass the Senate. President Biden says he will sign it into law. However, uh, on this TikTok bill, uh, there is a, a caveat here that says, uh, you know, it's not an outright ban. What needs to happen is that uh, U.S. lawmakers and the president are giving TikTok uh, their parent company, China-based ByteDance a chance to sell TikTok or divest it uh, and sell it to a U.S. business entity. Uh, they're giving them up to nine months uh, to do that, or else then they will ban it. Uh, the president then can step in and say, look, uh, you know, we'll give you an additional three months. So it's really up to a year before they uh, really will have to uh, sell it or divest it, Tom. All right, let's underscore that for all the TikTokers who are panicking right now. It's not going to happen right away. If it happens at all, it would be nine months to a year down the road, and we'll see how politics plays. But listen, let's get to now the Speaker of the House. Uh, you have known Mr. Johnson personally since 2017. He even called you last fall to tell you he was running for the Speakership. How have you managed to build that relationship over the years? Do you guys go way back? 
We do. Uh, you know, Speaker Johnson, when he was a backbencher, was really focused on the inside game of Washington, Tom, and I know you know the inside game. Others are focused on the outside game of Washington, being on Twitter, being on TV. That was not uh, Mike Johnson back then. Uh, that allowed him to forge relationships with other lawmakers who he needed uh, their support in order to become speaker. He also forged relationships with reporters. Uh, that allowed him to, to win the support to, to be in this position today. Uh, he did not have a lot of enemies. Things are very much different for Speaker Johnson today. Uh, Scott Wong, who knows how to work his sources and build relationships. Scott, thank you very much. Still to come, are you ready for it? Taylor Swift's new album is out and in typical Taylor fashion, already smashing records. But why are the reviews mixed? We will review the reviews next. Okay, a warning now to my fellow DC viewers and drivers. Make sure to check the traffic. There's going to be a speeder down Pennsylvania Avenue with a famous ex Formula One racer taking over the streets. It's, it's part of a new pitch by the defending F1 champs, Red Bull, to make one of the world's most popular sports more a thing here in the United States. And that's been a years-long endeavor. The U.S. is already home to more F1 races than any other country in Miami, in Austin, Texas, of course, Las Vegas. And our resident F1 expert, you would have never thought it, is Sahil Kapoor. He spoke with David Coltar, the retired driver behind the wheel. He's driven lots of iconic sites and says he wants to add one more. I get the images at the end to sort of, you know, it gives me this full life experience. All right. NBC Sahil, Sahil Kapoor joins me now. So tell us about this event tomorrow. We got it here. You got a chance to try out what it's like to drive an F1, right? This is your dream. That's right, Tom. This is happening at 4 to 6 p.m. tomorrow. The former Red Bull uh, racing driver, David Coulthard, will race their championship-winning car down Pennsylvania Avenue, just outside the Capitol. They're going to turn that iconic street into a racetrack for one day. Uh, now, I did get to jump into Red Bull's real-life race simulator, which their actual drivers use to hone their craft. It was quite thrilling to see what the drivers see when they zip down those straights at 200 miles an hour to see what it feels like with that heavy braking, to see how agile the cars are around corners. And lucky for me, I got some tips from a real life race winner in David Coulthard while, uh, while I was uh, racing that sim. The atmosphere behind me is pretty extraordinary. If you see, I, I rarely see stuff like this uh, in DC. There are a lot of F1 fans here. Uh, some of them took time off of work from their very busy jobs to come out here and to have fun, Dom. You know what I love about this is we see another side of you, some, a side of you you're passionate about, not just covering Capitol Hill. So let me then combine these two passions. Why does Red Bull, Red Bull rather, want to target D.C.? Is there some sort of lobbying effort underway? Oh, it's a lobbying effort for sure, but it's not a lobbying effort for the government. They're lobbying fans to get fired up about the sport. And if you look behind me, it's clearly working. There are a lot of fans here just uh, right, right behind me. There are fans doing pit stop practice, trying to take off the tires and the wheel guns. Uh, I talked to a whole bunch of fans over here. Some of them are old F1 fans for many years. Some of them are recent F1 fans. Uh, the, the, you know, the recent cocktail of COVID, Netflix's drive to survive, and, and an extraordinary thrilling 2021 season has brought a lot of new fans into the sport. I asked David Coulthard why people who aren't F1 fans should care about the sport. He said Americans want the latest and greatest of everything, and that's what F1 is to racing. Let's play what he said. If we look at the world we live in today, most people have a mobile phone or a laptop, and of course you want the latest and greatest because it just enhances your, your performance experience. What you have in Formula One is the fastest, most technologically advanced racing car series in the world. Now, the fans out here, Tom, are decked out in Red Bull gear. They're wearing merch of a whole bunch of teams. They're fans of, of many different teams and drivers here just came here to try to enjoy the Formula One atmosphere. In fact, I ran into a political source just about an hour ago who says he secretly took off work. He's not supposed to be here. I did agree to keep his uh, identity anonymous. 
<laughs> well, you, you took off work too, but I guess we roped you into a live shot. Let's talk about the popularity. We know F1's owner is a U.S.-based company, the same company that owns the Atlanta Braves. And as you've reported, F1 viewership last season went up uh, to a record, uh, I think it was a million viewers on ESPN, is that right? A double five years ago, but... Behind ESPN's other properties, like the NBA, MLB, and way behind That's Monday Night Football. So is this a critical year, then, for the F1? To preserve the recent growth of the fan base, and their second goal is to expand it. Now, it's going to be very difficult to expand it just given the extraordinary growth they've had recently, but that's why they're doing events like this, to give people an up-close and personal look at the cars, at, you know, one of the former drivers, and to get to experience what's happening right behind me, pit stop practice. Okay, uh, there you go. So Hill's passion uh, is right behind him. And have you heard of another passion out there? Taylor Swift's highly anticipated new album, The Tortured Poets Department, is out and already breaking records, becoming Spotify's most streamed album in a single day this year. It is a big day for Swifties. That's their passion. The album, the pop superstars, 11th dropped at midnight, but Swift surprised fans at 2 a.m. when she released another 15 songs, making this a double album, 31 songs in total. Some fans and critics, though, say that this might not be her best work, and it's all just too much Swift. Let's get now to NBC's Emily Ikeda, our own in-house Swifty. Uh, Emily uh, Swift has been releasing this constant stream of music, five new albums plus four pre-recorded ones as well since 2019 alone. Her record-breaking Eras tour is a three and a half hour marathon, 40 plus songs. I watched it. It was great. But give us a vibe check. Is Taylor Swift overexposed? Does this do more harm than good? Yeah, it really is quite stunning, especially when you see all of the albums in picture form there to show the amount of work, just how prolific of an artist that she is. You know, I, I think we've heard from some critics that, OK, they asked the question, is 31 songs too much? Could we have done with less or could have some of the stronger songs hit even harder had it been on a shorter track list? I guess it depends who you ask. A lot of fans will point out, well, look, this is a prolific artist and this is a trend and something that is just a part of her. She's always been known to release an immense amount of music. Take a look at the 10-minute version of All Too Well, or as, as you mentioned, her marathon of a concert, three and a half hours plus, that she continues to take around the world. Taylor Swift writing uh, on Instagram. Take a look at this. She says, I'd written so much tortured poetry in the past two years and wanted to share it all with you. So here's the second installment of TTPD, the anthology. It is two hours and two minutes of music, Tom. She is so talented and she is so prolific. How did this break new grounds in terms of marketing, though? And I think the question is going to be, is it paying off? I mean, she really is a marketing genius, so much so that is literally be being studied by various college courses. You take a look, she has teased this months ago and have been dropping uh, hints and lyrics at the Grammys, even uh, at various exhibits since then, building up this hype. And now, as you mentioned, it is already breaking uh, various records just hours since it's been released, Tom. Oh, I heard screaming in my house this morning, oh, uh, sure. <laughs> early this morning. All right, Emily, thank you very much. Uh, that is a wrap for this hour, but the coverage on News Now continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.